Hello from the FT studio in London. I'm Rula Khalaf, editor of the Financial Times, and I'll be speaking to Christine Lagarde, president of the European Central Bank, on the devastating impact of the coronavirus pandemic, the ECB response, and the shape of the recovery. President Lagarde, thank you um, for, this, for this opportunity to speak with the FT. It's been quite a start for you, quite a ride. Uh, you were at the helm of the ECB for about four months when the biggest crisis in generations um, struck. What's been, what has it been like for you and how do you think you've done? Well, it's been a very steep learning curve, no question about that. And uh, I think that together with members of the executive board and members of the governing council, we tried to respond as fast and as efficiently as we could in a situation that was uh, deteriorating very brutally. I mean, I've been through quite a few crises. Uh, I'm not a veteran of all crises, but I've been through the great financial crisis. I was very involved in the sovereign debt crisis. But this one, COVID-19, was very, very brutal. And, uh, and we had to respond extremely fast because we saw uh, a quasi seizure of the financial markets. Uh, we saw a, a, a dash for cash on the part of many of the key players. And we had to, you know, use all the tools we had and harness as much cooperation amongst central bankers in order to respond to the crisis. So I would say that it was a combination of using all the tools harnessing as much cooperation internationally as we could and making sure that the euro system at large, meaning of course the ECB, but also all the governing council members were on board and uh, using all, all those tools. When you think of, we'll come back to um, monetary policy, but when you think of the recovery, and we're starting to see a recovery, which uh, letter of the alphabet do you favor? Uh, you probably heard Andy Haldane uh, just last week talking about a V-shaped recovery, and that surprised many. Generally, you have been more restrained. Is, is, are you changing your mind at all? You know, I, I don't believe in um, this alphabet soup. Uh, that, uh, that we are uh, hearing about. I think this recovery is like no other. It's going to be constrained. Uh, it's going to be uncertain. And I think it's going to be uh, fragmented uh, across the world. Because clearly the pandemic has hit in a sequential way. It was an as a symmetric shock. But the recovery is also going to be sequential. So we are seeing countries like uh, China, like Korea, like Japan, like Australia coming out earlier than we are seeing uh, European countries at the moment. And we are seeing the, the Americas at large, including the US, but also Latin American countries at, at this, a later stage of this recovery process. So fragmented, certainly, and constrained by the, the, the uncertainty that we have around in terms of which sectors will be affected most, what impact policies will have, uh, what overall response will be produced, and what kind of cooperation will we see uh, between uh, countries of the world. Europe so far has avoided the massive job losses that we've seen in the US. Do you think this is sustainable? You know, I think that the reason um, many of the European countries are still um, showing reasonably good job numbers and uh, unemployment numbers that have not worsened dramatically had to do with the furlough system and the unemployment benefits that were available that actually um, kept employees employed and employers supported by guarantee schemes, by furlough schemes, which were not available in the same scope and uh, broad reach uh, in the US. So what, what, what will matter is what comes next. And are we going to have a, a, a coordination between 
the phasing out of unemployment benefits and furlough schemes and a pickup of activity, or are we going to face a gap in between, which would then see unemployment numbers rise uh, significantly? That, that's really one of the big issues. What about in terms of inequalities? Um, we have seen, and in fact we wrote a long piece today, about essential workers and the fact that uh, they are some of the lowest paid, have to take the most risk. Um, and yet we've, you know, societies and economies have not really valued uh, that work. Do you think that has to change? That has to be, uh, the, that has to be the focus of policymakers. What, what you learn from history is that in all these major crises, uh, whether they are um, natural disasters, whether they are pandemics. Uh, generally, the most vulnerable, the poorest, the women and the young people are the ones that are most affected and that are the clear uh, first victims of those situations. We, we have, there's plenty of literature about this particular topic. Uh, and, and, you know, policymakers have to really focus on, on that category. Let me just press you a little bit on that. Is what should policymakers then do? Well, I think you know they have to use the the tools available, and that includes uh, fiscal, of course. That includes uh, moral suasion in the private sector. That includes reassessing uh, the, the the values that uh, a society respects. And I would hope that the lessons uh, from you know the last three months will be remembered. I don't know if it was the case in the UK, but in many uh, countries on the continent at 8 p.m. everybody would go out on balconies and terraces and gardens to applaud uh, the people from the, the hospitals and, and the clinics. Well, it's not just a question of applauding them, it's also a question of acknowledging the huge value that they delivered to society and making sure that there is consideration for that in terms of you know, renewed social contract, if that's what you were referring to. Does it worry you um, that there's been a drift towards more protectionism and at the same time um, that there are rising tensions between the US and China? Uh, that is likely to damage the global economy uh, even more, just as we're trying, you know, just as uh, countries are trying to recover. You know, those trends that you're referring to uh, will obviously have an impact on, on economic development, will have an impact on growth, will have an impact on trade between countries. And what we have seen historically in the last 30 years is that what was called globalization has had a lot of benefits for many. And the reason uh, why so many people were taken out of poverty, out of starvation, had to do with globalization. Now, that's the rosy side of globalization. And clearly what we have also seen on the occasion of COVID-19 and the pandemic is that supply chains were probably stretched too much and to the point where basic uh, supplies were just no longer available. Uh, it has also demonstrated that um, while mobility is, of course, uh, good, proximity was seen as also very valuable and necessary uh, for the economic development of, of communities. So it may well be that this uh, particular crisis will transform our perception of globalization, proximity, short supply chain, control over one's destiny. And to me, what will really matter is how we can make those concepts that are close to people's desire and heart compatible with enough global development and multilateral relationships so that benefits can also fall out uh, to other countries and not just be restricted to your own shores. So you're hoping that it won't be a permanent setback for, for globalization? I think, I think the, whole, um, the, the whole set of relationships and business models of countries will have to be revisited. Countries cannot be exclusively driven and supported by trade and trade only, for instance. But equally, you cannot just close your borders and assume that you're going to operate in, 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 in your own restricted circle, because problems are of a global nature, because pandemic ignores borders, because capital, uh, you know, fly across the world. 
Let me ask just one small question on Brexit. Do you think that it will aggravate uh, the impact of the pandemic on European um, economies because of the timing of Brexit at the end of the year, whether it's with a deal or, or without a deal? Uh, you know, if you combine uh, two downside risks, uh, two uncertain outcomes, you clearly have a multiplier impact. So how one will reinforce the other, I don't know. But uh, they are heading in the same direction, which is not an easy one. Let's talk about monetary uh, policy. Um, it's interesting that when you took over, the view amongst economists was that the ECB had reached the limit of uh, monetary policy and that the best you could do is to cajole, uh, convince governments uh, to embrace uh, fiscal stimulus. Instead, now you say that there is no limits. This is, this is the new motto, is no limits to what the ECB is willing to do? Our support to the euro is unlimited, yes. But that's because we have a mandate, which is price stability, and which dictates that we pay very close attention to both monetary stance, to monetary transmission, that we are attentive that uh, financing is not tightened to the point where uh, economic actors uh, cannot develop activity, and I think that's exactly what we have applied at the time when the crisis started unfolding. And uh, we had to look at what was available and uh, we had to invent uh, new instruments in order to respond to the crisis and make sure that uh, we could actually deliver on our mandate. And is there a hard limit to the pandemic uh, emergency purchase program? And if there is one, then what happens next? You know, I would observe that through the, uh, the, the, the impact of the massive programs that we put in place, uh, the situation has calmed down enormously. Uh, the tightening that we had seen loosened. Uh, the, you know, I'll give you an example. We have, together with a, a, a few other key central banks around the world, we have those uh, US dollar swap lines that were in a very high demand at the beginning of the crisis. Now, none of it is needed. That's an example. So I believe that the measures we have taken have actually demonstrated their efficiency, their effectiveness, and were just right uh, in responding to the, to the situation. So, you know, we are going to be very attentive uh, to the economic developments to the many numbers that are popping out, whether it's PMI, whether it's services, whether it's employment, whether it's inflation and the like of it, to make sure that our tools are properly calibrated and can respond adequately to the, to the current situation. We, we have a very, um, how would I put it? Um, we receive myriads of numbers at the moment, but it's, it's very uncertain. And it's going to take a while before we have a solid response from, from the economic terrain, if you will, uh, to really assess the effectiveness of what we do, uh, as well as the, uh, the prospects of what will happen. But we have done so much that we have quite a bit of time uh, to assess that um, Carefully. Why did you say at the very beginning of um, the crisis that the ECB's role wasn't to manage spreads between Italian and German bonds? Well, first of all, I think that that's, that was pre-pandemic. Uh, that was pre-major uh, uh, programs that we put in place in order to make sure that there was plenty of liquidity, that the transmission channels were not impaired, which is... Uh, part of our duties uh, and an important one. And uh, before we made sure that uh, uh, banks were in a position to lend to uh, the economy, both at the top corporate levels, as well as the entrepreneur level. And I think that that, that is the best response that we could give at the time. Germany's finance ministry said last week uh, that the ECB had fulfilled the requirements of the um, constitutional court. Um, it, it does look like 
that particular case is uh, on its way to being resolved. Uh, even if it is, though, is, does it not set a dangerous precedent and undermine the independence of the ECB? How do you look at it? You know, I'm a lawyer by background. So I look, I look at the, uh, the legal ground on which we stand. And uh, the first thing I see is the independence of the European Central Bank, number one which doesn't mean to say that it's unaccountable. The ECB is accountable uh, to the European Parliament. The European Central Bank uh, has a court uh, which has jurisdiction over it, which is the, uh, uh, the European Court of Justice. And uh, to me, that, that's critically important. Uh, the treaty has to be respected. It was put together. And with great interest on the part of Germany, by the way, that a central bank has to be independent. And I think we, we need to, to stand by those principles, uh, which uh, I think we have. Uh, in the case of the most recent decision that was rendered in Germany, the German authorities found the right level of response. Uh, and we supported as part of the good uh, relationship that we have with all our members. Uh, we supported uh, the, the Bundesbank to make sure that the principles of proportionality was properly evidenced and demonstrated as, as it has been applied ever since uh, we went into uh, monetary policy for that matter. You didn't look at it as a, as a dangerous precedent? Not at all. Not at all, because as I said, the treaties speak uh, for the legal ground on which we stand. Accountability to European Parliament, uh, European law as the applicable law, and the European Court of Justice as the court which has jurisdiction uh, over us. Uh, so that, that's, um, that's our story. Um, let's talk about negative rates. Why do you think that um, they're beneficial when the Fed and the Bank of England have steered clear of them? You know, we look at it very carefully. And uh, we, whenever we decide uh, a monetary policy stance, whenever we decide to use a particular tool, we always look at how effective it is, how efficient it is, and how proportional it is. Those are the three yardsticks against which we, we measure such or such other tool. And clearly, we look backward to make sure that uh, the test of time is actually demonstrating that it is, or that it was, the right tool to use. And our experience with negative rate uh, is, is actually positive overall. Now, it's clear that if you are uh, granular to the point where you only look at one category of transactions or one category of citizens, uh, you might reach a different conclusion. But we have to look at the overall euro area. We have to look at uh, overall categories of economic players. And we have to look at the overall circumstances under which we operate. And we have to look at the impact that such measures will have. So at this point in time, uh, clearly, and given the circumstances that prevailed at the time, it was the right decision to go for these negative rates. The main, the main criticism is that it's corrosive um, and that, especially on banks and, and insurance, and that it fuels bubbles in, um, in property, for, for example. Um, what do you say to the critics? I say exactly what I say to you very openly, is that we have to look at all aspects, all consequences, and all uh, effects of a particular uh, monetary policy. And you cannot only look at the, um, the category of the savers. You also ha have to look at the borrowers. Uh, you have to look at the level of desired investment. Uh, you have to look at the volume of savings. You have to take all these factors into account to determine whether, on balance, uh, the tool that has been selected as a policy going forward is actually delivering uh, effective, efficient, and proportional uh, outcome. And this, this certainly has been the case. There's another concern that I hear often, and that is that the ECB is financing gov uh, governments by buying so much uh, sovereign debt to the point where it may, uh, you know, it, it may have to just perpetuate this because governments won't be able to stand uh, on their own feet. Is that a valid concern? 
You know, it's clear that there are many, many other investors and purchasers out there to buy sovereign debts at the moment. It's, uh, it's, you know, we are seeing it on a regular basis, whether it's issuance of green bonds by some member states or whether it's issuance of very, very long-term maturity uh, bonds by others, or whether it's large issuance, there is a serious appetite on the part of investors. So I think that, you know, the European Central Bank is not uh, the only game in town when it comes to, to buying those bonds. It's, there is a market out there, it's a vibrant one, and, uh, you know, the, the, the policies that we have in place are showing their efficiency. Some economists are asking whether the ECB will ever hit its inflation targets. Well, clearly, uh, the, uh, the price stability that is inscribed uh, in the treaty is dictating and driving uh, our action, because it is our single mandate. It was defined um, back in 2003 as close to but below 2%. And if you look at a longer period of time than the last few years, uh, clearly that goal was reached. It's only recently uh, that it, it has been uh, lower uh, than what the average was over the last 20 years or so. And clearly we have the aim of uh, targeting that uh, price stability, which is our mandate, and we will continue to deploy the tools that we have in order to do so. One caveat, though, uh, is the fact that we will be uh, resuming, finally, our strategy review. And clearly, inflation, inflation components, measurements, price stability definition will be under review. But I have no doubt that we will be driven by our price stability mandate on a going forward basis. I want to ask you in a, about review in a, in a minute, but just to stay on inflation, um, there is a debate right now about whether we're going into an inflationary uh, environment or towards def deflation. Uh, where, what do you say? Ha, that, that's a really difficult question because uh, we are seeing disinflationary forces at the moment. And uh, I think there are many economists to argue that uh, there is more of that um, and, and potential deflationary risk, but I'd rather talk about disinflationary forces in the short term, and then total uncertainty as to the medium to longer term. You know, when we look at our, our medium term projection, we are pretty close uh, to numbers that we had pre-COVID, to give you an example. Now, you know, how these uh, economic forces, how this economic transition how the digitization uh, of the economy, how the greening of our economies will impact prices and the measurement of inflation uh, is, is going to be a, you know, a major uh, determinant of uh, what, uh, what inflation will, will look like going forward. But it may well be uh, inflationary in the, in the longer term. It's part of the uncertainty that, that abounds at the moment. Yeah, as you say, very difficult question. Um, turning to fiscal uh, policy, how important is it for, for the ECB that EU governments agree on the 750 billion euro recovery fund? I think it's important for all Europeans. Uh, and it's important because it will demonstrate uh, clearly uh, a, common, a sense of common destiny, a sense of solidarity, uh, that needs to be demonstrated in times of crisis. Uh, the fact that um, that recovery plan be large, fast, and focused on those areas that need improvement and those countries that suffered the most will demonstrate that there is a European Union and that there is unity of purpose in order to uh, continue to build and develop this, uh, this market. I think a lot of Europeans in, in the first days of the crisis started to doubt that because there was no uh, solidarity. Um, so I, I see your point. Will, but do you think it's, it can ensure a solid recovery? You know, I think it's a game changer, let's face it. Because what we have seen during the crisis is uh, a strong fiscal response at the national level, um, 
a very rapid and strong and convincing monetary response. A little bit of a European response uh, thanks to the ESM new program, thanks to the SURE unemployment support, thanks to the EIB additional guarantees for companies. That was good. But the real game changer uh, element is the recovery fund, in particular if a good chunk of it is in the form of grants rather than loans, because it will in that case establish a degree of unity and solidarity to benefit those that have suffered most. We should know possibly in, uh, in a week or in a, almost a week, uh, but... You know, I, would, I wouldn't... I, I know that there is a lot of hype and everybody would like to see on July 17th at 6.30 and three minutes the outcome of, you know, conclusive discussions. You know, I've, for those of us who've been around Brussels a bit, it takes a few days, it takes a few nights, and I wouldn't be surprised that it comes later in July. So I wouldn't put all my bets on July the 18th. But are you concerned about a divergence um, with a sort That's of two-speed two Europe uh, after, in terms of the recovery? You know, it's always a risk that uh, going into the crisis, there was uh, that, that, a, a degree of uh, divergence and that coming out of the crisis, that divergence subsists and is possibly worsened. I think the whole purpose of the, uh, of the recovery plan is to try to re-establish a level playing field and to compensate those that have been worst hit by the pandemic. W would that put an uneven recovery? Would presumably put more pressure on the ECB because some will want you to be tapering, others will not. Well, we will deal with that in due course. There's a governing council, there is an executive board, and, uh, and we try to work as, as cooperatively as we can in good, in good intelligence. Let's turn to the strategic review because one of your objectives, and it was put on hold, but it's, it's just been uh, restarted. One of your objectives was to include um, combating climate change. How do you see the role uh, of a central bank when it comes to climate change? You know, I think when it comes to climate change, it's everybody's responsibility. And where I, where I stand, where I sit here as, as head of the European Central Bank, I want to explore every avenues available in order to combat climate change. This is something that I hold very uh, strongly. And I believe that as we have this price stability mandate that I described for you earlier on, climate change actually has an impact on price stability. If we fail to measure externalities, if we fail to anticipate drought, if we fail to anticipate uh, variations of prices of food, of energy, of services, then we're not doing our job. So I think that even without changing our mandate, climate change has an impact. And I'll, I'll tell you, it has an impact on how we model um, economy going forward, how we forecast, how we measure risk, how we stress test uh, uh, institutions, uh, how we uh, value the collaterals that we receive, uh, how we link uh, and, and join forces with other uh, national central banks to explore together what policies can actually have a decisive impact on fighting climate change. So this clearly will be part of our strategy, but I, I wouldn't want you to think that we're suddenly discovering it. Yeah. The ECB has addressed the issues of climate change. I think the impetus and the, the momentum is just stronger now and has to be multifaceted and has to look at all uh, the, the business lines and the operations in which we are engaged in order to tackle climate change. Because at the end of the day, money talks. There have been some signs that um, the fight against um, climate change may be sacrificed um, in, as a goal, as um, companies and governments deal with the impact of, of the pandemic. Uh, do, do you worry about that at all? I think those who uh, would be tempted by that option would live to regret it. And, uh, you know, I have children, I have grandchildren. I just don't want to face those beautiful eyes 
asking me and others, what have you done? How did you fight for my future? Have you protected biodiversity? And so on and so forth. So I think it's, it's an imperative that uh, generations will impose on us if we tend to forget it. It's a concept that markets will also force on us if we tend to forget. Um, let me ask you about diversity. The Fed has spoken out um, again uh, on racial diversity and how the pandemic has disproportionately um, impacted uh, black and ethnic uh, minorities. Has the ECB made any, any statements? And, and is that something um, that you're concerned about? The issue is in, in Europe, in a lot of countries, we don't even have data. So it's quite impossible to know. But in the UK, there's no doubt uh, that we've seen this, a similar impact on uh, black and ethnic minorities. As, as you just said, we, we do not, not have much by way of data, simply because data are not accepted. It's, it's illegal to actually trace uh, by way of, of uh, uh, color, religion, and so on and so forth in many countries uh, in the Euro area. So we don't, we don't have much by way of data. But, you know, it suffice to look at, at uh, um, the diversity that we have, and, and clearly there is progress to be, to be made, and, uh, and we have to continue delivering on the targets that are set for gender purposes, but we have to look beyond uh, gender diversity. We have to look at, at all diversities. You're one of three women um, who are deciding the future of uh, Europe at, uh, at this time, um, with all due respect for the very powerful men. But you, the Commission President, the German Chancellor, uh, how closely do you coordinate? I know that you know Angela um, Merkel very well, uh, but how well do you know Ursula von der Leyen? Well, we know each other uh, quite well. and. Uh, I, as you said, I, 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 I've known the Chancellor for quite a few years, and we are both veterans of, of Europe in some way, and, uh, and I've attended many meetings together, and we're often the only two women in, in big rooms full of men. Uh, and that certainly, from my perspective, I don't want to speak for, for her, because, um, but from my perspective, it, it does produce this uh, complicity and... and uh, and um, friendship um, that is often generated by minority members. Uh, I, I go back with Ursula for quite a few years as well because we were sitting on, on you know, same um, groups or, or, or board meetings um, in various institutions. So we know each other well and we do communicate with, with each other on a regular basis. President Lagarde, we're out of time. Thank you very much for speaking to me. My pleasure.